right, here we go. Okay. For those of you who are familiar with LA Court Report, we host uh, once every two weeks conversations. Uh, we call it a coach's round table. And today we're here for a different reason than normal. A week ago, a video surfaced of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old African-American man in Kenosha, Wisconsin, being shot by police after they responded to a call regarding domestic violence. After this incident, a wave of protests swept through the NBA beginning Wednesday, August 26th, when teams chose not to play their scheduled games, and then games resumed uh, yesterday, Saturday, August 29th. Similar protests and acts of solidarity took place in Major League Baseball, the WNBA, and Major League Soccer. With LA Court Report, we provide coverage of the high school basketball scene in Southern California. We have hosted dialogues with high school and college coaches about racial equality, social justice, Black Lives Matter, and we have just discussed the importance of the all vote, no play initiative taking place at universities across the country. With the recent protests in the NBA, the general feeling from high school coaches is that they wanna take the strong emotions that they are feeling, the strong emotions that their players are feeling and channel them into something productive. The stand the NBA players took is very inspiring, but for all of us, it was a call to action. It's important to shed light on injustice, but we're not here today to talk about how these issues make us feel. We're here to talk about how we can get involved. So we've arranged a group of high school coaches as well as history and government teachers who can answer the question, what can I do? Especially because the big push has been get your players voting, but at the high school level, you may have a few players who are not eligible to vote yet. A lot of coaches are saying, I wanna see my athletes become civically engaged, but they aren't old enough to vote. So we're here today to address that issue in a small group setting, and we do plan later to revisit that in a larger Zoom conversation. We've had many high school coaches reach out and they say they wanna be a part of it, but we'd like to go ahead and give them some tips to getting started. So right now off the bat, the question for the group is, what can we tell high school coaches who say, I want my players to be involved, but many of them are going to be under the age of 18 by the next election. What advice do we have for them? Um, I, I think an important thing is getting them to, in the state of California especially, uh, and Oregon, to pre-register at the ages of 16 and 17. And if they're 18, getting them registered to vote uh, and allowing them the process of getting the information um, who they should vote for or who their family feels that they should vote for. David, he talked about pre-registration. Can you talk about the process on how to pre-register? It is really easy. They go online and fill out the form and whatever information there is. The last time I checked, they had to um, print something out, sign it, and send it. So there's a little extra step if they have a printer or don't have a printer, but that's the last time I checked. But it, it is pretty easy. Um, and even though they can't vote right now, uh, there's several things that they can do to reach out to voters in other states if they want to focus on the national election and look at swing states and send letters and postcards to swing voters out there and encourage voting. Um, if, if they're concerned about the issue of policing, uh, policing is a very local issue, it's a city issue. And too often we forget about voting or paying attention to city politics and who's on the city council who's on the county board of supervisors. And in LA, in LA County, the LA sheriffs is overseen by the, the board of supervisors. And so um, encouraging students to pay attention to city council meetings, speaking at city council meetings, sending letters to city council members, finding out who their city council members are and where they stand on the issue of uh, policing and funding and, and what the police should do and should not do. Um, that is very much city politics. And I think that's an area where a lot of young people can make a, a huge impact. Thanks very much. Mike, I know that you've, you're the coach at Westview High School in Oregon in the Portland area. Uh, I know that Portland has its share of uh, civic issues right now. Can you talk about what happened this weekend at Portland? Well, so this has been ongoing for quite some time. Um, I think the characterizations are often uh, inaccurate, uh, at least in terms of its uh, widespread nature. I think it's great that uh, there's opportunities for, uh, for peaceful protest and participation in um, the freedoms that are granted by our constitution. Uh, but I've had a lot of 
people call me asking about what's going on in Portland. I live five miles from downtown. Uh, and if I didn't turn on the local news, uh, I wouldn't know what was happening. It's not uh, this uh, apocalyptic uh, picture of the end of the world, which uh, has been painted. Uh, it has had some ebbs and flows. Obviously, there was a, uh, some issues with uh, federal um, troops uh, in Portland, but specifically in the last couple of days, uh, I think uh, there's been a resurgence of activity around uh, the conversations about, or in response to what happened in, in Kenosha. Um, and unfortunately, last night, uh, there was actually, a, uh, there was a homicide uh, at the protests uh, as a result of a gunshot. Uh, there was a uh, cavalcade of cars, uh, which, and last weekend, a cavalcade of boats uh, that were uh, pro Trump supporters. Uh, and they, uh, last night, the car caravan was met by ca counter protesters uh, on foot uh, downtown. And unfortunately, uh, and again, only based on videos I've seen, uh, there were some confrontations that were escalated and heated, uh, ultimately leading to uh, some car on pedestrian collisions. Uh, and then there was gunfire last night that ended up in uh, the death of one of the, of, of the protesters. So I don't know a whole lot more in terms of those details, but in conversations that I've had with our players in response going back to the start of the George Floyd uh, murder was, um, you know, coach, what do we do or, or what can we do or what should we do? Uh, and that's where I think some of this momentum is, uh, it's been a struggle because we want to do something and we all talk and we all have feelings and there's emotions uh, throughout all these conversations because uh, hopefully it means a lot to everybody. Uh, this is our country. This is uh, the world that as educators, we are trying to prepare young people to become citizens uh, uh, involved in uh, our democracy. And uh, the hardest part has been, uh, how do you counsel students who are between the ages of 14 and 17 uh, on what to do. Uh, and again, for us, uh, the spotlight has come on Portland. It's become a political conversation at the national level uh, because it makes for good sound bites and good video. But ultimately, uh, what I, I believe in is that there are groups of people, regardless of partisan affiliation, who want to exercise their right to speak out. Uh, what's troubling is uh, when that leads to violence and how do we counsel uh, the kids we work with um, through some of that stuff. And those have been the most challenging conversations for sure. I appreciate that. So my understanding is that you and Lou, as well as Jamal Adams at Loyola High School, who couldn't join us today, have created sort of a step-by-step -step that you'd like to kind of share with your athletes about what they can do? Because that's the question I think teachers and coaches are getting the most is what can I do? And you've actually addressed that. Uh, yeah, it, the, it's, it was certainly grown organically. Lou and I had a, a really impactful conversation for me. Uh, I think after the start of it, he said, I got him fired up. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where I think there's an opportunity to capture um, that level of enthusiasm. And again, uh, my conversations with our students and in, per in particular, our students, our, our student athletes of color was, coach, what can we do? What do we do? Uh, and I've had a couple of really uh, strong-willed and thoughtful young men who have led this charge uh, and I'm hopeful just in the vacuum of my own world that this is happening in lots of other places. And so when I reached out to some of my friends and that's even, you know, Lou and I got connected only a couple of days ago because I found out he was working on something similar. And I think the ch challenge for all of us is who do we target and then how do we move forward? Uh, so in, in terms of actionable items, 
uh, in our conversation, at least in my mind, uh, I tried for a moment to, uh, to make it a conversation about exponential growth to our students. Uh, those who weren't so good at math uh, gave me some uh, quizzical looks, but uh, you know, we wanted to challenge our student athletes to become voices in the community. And you know, in response to this idea of thinking globally and acting locally, um, I was challenged because my uh, former boss and one of my closest friends and mentors, Eric Reveno, was a leading voice in the college movement for All Vote, No Play, and the idea to make November 3rd a no participation day. And when that momentum started in June after the George Floyd murder, again, as a high school coach, I had I was challenged with, well, coach, what do you think we can do? Uh, my kids aren't old enough to vote and won't be in November. Uh, I actually do have one kid. I found out he does turn 18 in September, but um, the majority of the kids in our program obviously are not. Uh, and then as a vote by mail state, we don't have polling places. So the idea to you know be a participant in an the, uh, the democratic process to volunteer at a polling place. Uh, we can't even do that. And despite uh, hopefully the impact of whatever's going on at the federal level with the post office, uh, we're one of, I think, eight or nine states, maybe the history teachers can, can, can correct me that we only vote by mail. There are no polling places in Oregon. Uh, and so we were just sort of, right, the, the brainstorm around what can we do and then um, our kids said, well, you know, I can talk to my parents and I can talk to people that we know who are 18. We know one of our kids was really committed to, um, maybe just because he's the social butterfly of our group, but he thought he could get every senior who just graduated who's going to be 18 that he's friends with to vote. Uh, he claimed he was going to be friends with all 650 of them, but um, I, I'll hold him to that challenge if he thinks he can do it. Uh, but so for us, it was about you know, we started with recognizing the problem, right? And I don't, if you want to go th through the deck, we'll wax it and we can go through it. Um, but uh, I, I would, you know, that's our motivation. That was our drive. That was a, uh, as an educator is how can we make it a student driven initiative to let them go do things, not just, you know, like anything, uh, you know, if one person is the, is the hub of the, of the wheel, there's a bottleneck and how much can get done. So um, that was kind of our, our, our impetus. And maybe, you know, Lou can share sort of what O'Dowd has done and how they have structured their thinking behind the same or similar right, initiative. Um, thanks, Mike. In, in June, when we were having the protests up here, I sat down with John Burris. He's one of the leading civil rights attorneys in the country. Um, and Leron Armstrong, who's a neighbor of mine, and he's a deputy chief of police in Oakland. And, you know, we got in my backyard one night and we said, you know, what are things we can do? And I said, John, you know, you've been around before. Tell me what's going to happen. He said, well, they've already created a task force that he sits on and you're going to have the protesters meet with city officials and then they'll compromise. And he said, all the, all the protests will go away at some point. And he said, the only thing meaningful that you can really do is get people to register to vote. So that was beginning of June, and you know I said, let me go ahead and talk to my school. Um, you know I didn't get the response that I wanted, um, so I said, you know I'll take it upon myself to start with these bunch of kids, and um, I figured, you know with COVID around, we're going to have a lot of time on our hands. Um, so I got you know all the kids that played for me last year to register. I made sure I reached out to all the alumni in the last eight years that they had registered. Um, I got all of the kids on JV and varsity that could pre-register too, um, and kind of did it as a beta trial. Um, and then from there said, okay, now can you all go out and get 10 more people? Um, and then I kind of came up with a number, you know, I know that I'm on an email list in California that has about 400 people on it. Uh, I talked to Matt King in, in Arizona, he's over Arizona, Nevada. And I talked to a bunch of Nike coaches across the country, and I said, why not get 1,000 coaches to get 100 kids? You know, it only takes five minutes to pre-register and register to vote. Um, you know, the challenge is going to be getting the kids to be advocates and get other kids. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping to do, hoping that we all can do, um, which is why when Mike called me, I got, like I said, 
he's one of the few people that I've talked to. Uh, I mean, I, I've probably talked to about 100 coaches around the country and in the Bay Area, but he was the first to call me out of the blue, and that kind of relit the, the, the torch for me, and I, I thank Mike for that because, you know, it, it's been a difficult week for me, um, you know, feeling less than motivated, feeling why are we doing this? Does it even matter? Um, so as a, as a, I want to say a young black man, but I guess, I guess at 49, I'm not a young black man anymore. Um, it, sometimes it can be overwhelming. We've had uh, one of our kids at Odell, his sister committed suicide um, in, uh, in April. Uh, and then we just had a young man that overdosed yesterday that was close to our basketball team as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging times. So when I get a phone call like that from Mike, I'm fired up. And thanks, Mike. Hey, I appreciate that. Hey, Lou, what, when you said that when you – this whole, you know, when you began this process, you reached out, you contacted your school directly and said that you didn't get the type of response you were looking for. Um, who did you contact? What was that response? And what type of response were you ultimately hoping for? And I, and I asked that question in a way of, you know, a one to ten, um, did they say just no? We don't want to do anything, or it's not our place. What what exactly did that? That's that's a little disheartening to hear. The first person I talked to just said, "Hey, I think someone in our school is already doing that. Uh, why don't you reach out to somebody else?" Uh, which wasn't the response I wanted. I reached out yeah. to a second person of the administration, and they said, uh, "You know what? I think someone else is doing that. I'm supposed to have a meeting with them. Uh, why don't I follow back up with you?" And, and I reached out to the third person who said, yeah, Lou, I think we are doing something. Um, I'm supposed to meet with the second person you talked to. I'll get back to you. Uh, okay, so that just, nobody had anything. Nobody had anything then. So, you know, as as an individual, it makes you wonder, it, you know, why was that lack of response? Is it you don't have the bandwidth, which is understandable, but that was never explained to me. Is it this is not a priority? Um, is it you're just a basketball coach, stay in your lane? Uh, is it, you know, we don't think that you are, you know, intelligent enough to execute the, the process? You know, I, I don't know. And I never got that information. And I, in, instead of delving deeper, I said, you know, let me continue to make inroads in other areas. And as I, I talked to Mike, the idea initially was if there was no COVID, that where Odell sits, that we could actually go into the neighborhood because below Odell, is a, is, a, is a very middle class, lower middle class hood type environment. So Dow was kind of looked at as this elite white institution on the hill that if you walked a mile down from Odell, people probably wouldn't have very good things to say about Bishop Odell. So I, I've always been one that's tried to change that view, that perception. And I thought this was a great opportunity and I was passionate about it. And when my passion wasn't matched, you know, my, like I told my, my feelings were hurt. You know, it hurt me. Yeah. I care about my community. I care about Oakland. And, you know, I think my resume as an educator, you know, I got an undergraduate degree. I got a master's. I started a doctoral program. I, I, I think I've been pretty proven in terms of activists. So, um, like I said, when Mike reached out to me, being the first person to just have similarities and, and finding someone that cares about his community and, and kids, I mean, it was it warmed my heart. I have a question for, um, for everyone. Do you think that, that schools in general um, are hesitant at embracing student activism? Um, and do you think that's gonna change um, because pro athletes are getting more involved in politics? Great question. I, I think this, this time right now, I also wanna give credit to, to schools with the COVID era I could understand administration and faculty being overwhelmed. You know, for us, we're going back into an online virtual environment. We didn't have a summer off. We were doing professional development all summer. I could understand how when I wanted to do this two months ago, it wasn't something that was, you know, necessarily on everyone's radar. Now with NBA sports and everything, it's, you know, it's something that's, it's more relevant. I don't want to say it's cool, but it's definitely more relevant. So I think, trying to be optimistic, I think that's also a piece of it. I'd like to echo that. Our school district, for example, um, has instituted a mandatory professional development for all teachers and, and coaches and 
in, in uh, they're calling it uh, social justice leadership. So I have a social justice leadership course to start attending, um, you know, several hours this fall. I think it's a seven hour course. And, um, you know, I, I believe there would be a sense that a uh, vote initiative um, brought forth by students, not just in the sport of basketball, obviously professional basketball has been a, a tremendous leader in uh, recent months on all kinds of issues. But um, I, I would think we would find some, some colleagues um, in the classroom and coaches in other uh, sports that would be open to it. And, you know, for myself, um, after we get the game plan down here, I'm looking forward to reaching out to those people in, in this way. I think for us, um, uh, there's definitely scramble mode across the school about uh, trying to re to reimagine learning. In a, you know, that's the priority. Uh, you know, we started an online school in the district. Uh, Westview lost 75 kids to that school, which is a financial hit to our um, to our to our APU. Um, the tools and resources and you know, one of the biggest concerns is that we have great teachers who are not going to be very good uh, as digital learning environment teachers uh, and so uh, administration's number one priority is uh, how do we close the the digital equity divide how do we get ready for the start of school um, and I, I got a lot of support from the principal and our athletic director uh, but it was great go for it what you know it wasn't uh you know let me add that onto my plate of things you know at least for the principal um you know and, and i don't know if uh as a public school teacher uh there's some type of underlying feedback that makes this feel like a partisan right issue um like i talk with our guys about that in our mission statement that this voting is not a partisan conversation like voting is and you know the quote on our first slide in the deck is um is the uh is you know written by the census bureau and that you know particip participation across the board has dropped for 40 years in our democracy and that's at a federal level, at a state, and even at a local level. And so um, I, I think if we reached out to more people, uh, you know, the first thing my AD said was, well, what can I do? Uh, uh, he's in a hospital you know, right now with his wife who just had a baby. I told him he just needs to sleep. But uh, there's not a whole lot to do, uh, I think, uh, at that level, because they just, I think we just need to know that they support us. And then those of us who have immediate and direct contact with these young men and women who can then take up the charge, like, again, uh, you know, Lou and I can run around until we're blue in the face, but you multiply our efforts by 10, 20, and 30, um, that makes a, a much bigger impact a lot faster. I think something that's really important to keep in mind is that teenagers seek instant gratification because that's where they are in their in development. So when you tell a kid to vote, it can often sound dismissive. Kids are upset. They want to know how injustices like the murder of George Floyd, they want to know how being shot in the back by a police officer with little repercussion can't be addressed quickly and instantly because in their world, things are addressed quickly and instantly. So how do we encourage young people to vote with also out not sounding dismissive? Because when someone comes to you, when a student comes to you, when an athlete comes to you and says, I'm really upset and I want to make a change, and you say, make sure to vote, for them doing something in November to the problem that they're feeling now is very difficult for them. Is, is there, are there any suggestions from the group as to how to handle something like that? Well, what we've done is we've definitely – try to have you know zoom meetings with our kids you know mm -hmm. freitas was kind enough to be on one with our, our group uh a couple of nights ago and we talked with our senior parents and their families and we had college coaches and scouts on there um but what we've tried to do is we really try to encourage our kids to talk about it to be in safe mm -hmm. spaces 
talk with their families, talk with their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a sports psychologist that works with us at Bishop Bodau um, to let them know that they, can eat, they need to share and say how they're feeling. Um, and then control what you can control. Uh, even though you know, most young people don't think life's fair uh, and coming to grips with that, life isn't fair. And you know, if you as a student did something and broke a rule and you were held accountable immediately, sometimes it doesn't happen like that in the real world. There are processes that things have to go through. So control what you can control. And then ultimately after that, the one thing you can control is registering or pre-registering to vote and trying to get information out there, uh, true information of, about candidates and about you know, uh, what your community really needs. Yeah, we've, we've had some coaches come to us, as I said, and they've asked what we recommend. And not just telling your athletes to vote, but something that's really serious is there's this trend to vote in November when it's the presidential election. And those municipal elections that aren't as, as exciting, aren't as scintillating, when you're voting for someone like a judge, that can affect your future just as much as who you vote for president. So really imploring your players to understand the purpose of civic engagement is a very, very important thing. Uh, a question that came through the chat was, uh, Coach Bush, have you started the professional development, that social justice leadership program? Because uh, we would love to hear. It was rolled out um, in August, and I wasn't available to attend an all-day session on uh, one of the Saturdays in August. And so my time to take it begins in October and it's I think seven Monday mornings in a row um, an eight to 9 a.m. class before a regular school starts. So I can't give you feedback on the, on the exact nature of, of that content right this second. Um, what's occurred to me just listening to the comments, other things that maybe teams can do in addition to getting on board um, this roadmap of a, a voter um, registration drive would be to have, uh, like we're recording this Zoom right now, to have a team discussion uh, recorded on Zoom and put it up on social media for you know uh, the followers of, of uh, our, our athletes and our programs are numerous you know throughout um, throughout the community and um, you know. It's a way for our uh, student athletes to be known other than just as, uh, you know, kids playing basketball, but, but also as young citizens. And, and, you know, they're articulate and passionate and it'd be a great um, exposure for them, I think. As a um, social studies teacher, it comes very natural to me to talk about social issues and politics. And I could, I could imagine um, some coaches not being very comfortable with that. And I think starting small and, and meeting, meeting your students where they're at is, is great. And having a meeting, a Zoom meeting, keeping at a safe space, and just simply put out a, a question of, what's been your experience with the police? Um, and make it in a safe, comfortable way and, and allow students to be vulnerable and hear stories from each other. Um, I tell my students that as a suburban middle class male born in America, I've, I've been very comfortable with the police in my life. And, um, and being open and be, being able to share that to students, I think allows them to say, okay, I can share my story and maybe start from there. Uh, and if policing is the issue that they want to tackle, um, it's, not a, it's not a partisan issue because democratic governments have problems with the police. Republican governments have problems with the police. And so I, I know that, um, if teachers and coaches, uh, especially in public schools, don't want to tackle it, something that's particularly partisan, take an issue, take an issue and then and learn about it and communicate it with your local leaders, local um, council people and, and mayors, and have students share their stories or have students share their opinions to those leaders. And that's one way to kind of get to the issue right away without having to vote uh, or waiting, you know, a year or two to vote. Um, those are things that can happen in between elections, uh, no matter who's in office. Yeah, David, I, I really think that, that you hit that on the head and it sort of echoes what everybody said. These conversations, and again, in our sort of, we tried to make it in the structure of what we wanted to, to push out to the community, something that was simple enough for our guys to understand their sort of expectations, but, you know, step 
one was conversation and having those conversations. And, you know, Lou mentioned that sometimes those are uncomfortable conversations and yet, you know, and I, I'm preparing because I know this week I'm, I'm going to reach out to all the coaches in our pro uh, at our school about this. Um, we're starting some online professional development stuff and there's some downtime when I've reached out and scheduled some of those meetings. Cause I'm okay. Like I want to have those uncomfortable conversations and we talk all the time as coaches about helping your kids get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? You know, we want them to go over speed in their ball handling drills. And if they're not, if the ball's not, you know, bouncing away in a ball handling drill, then they're not going hard enough to get better. Uh, and so I think we have to hold ourselves to that same standard and uh, modeling, I think is huge. Uh, you know, the kids modeling that conversation, modeling the discomfort, especially if, you know, maybe, you know, for a social studies teacher or, you know, in my case, language arts teacher, the, those are conversations that we have more often than maybe uh, Lou does as a PE teacher. Not that maybe Lou's not the best out of anybody at having them, but um, it's what you do on a regular basis. And sometimes I know for us, a lot of our coaches have expressed at other times discomfort because, you know, they're, they're responsible. Well, I'm a PE teacher. Um, but, you know, even simple things about going back and having conversations about uh, understanding some of the vocabulary that gets kicked around. Um, you know, I, there's a, a, there's a college coach here uh, outside of Portland at Willamette U uh, University. Um, and, you know, uh, Kip Ione, he's a, he's, a, he's, he's a man of color who uh, has developed a really robust curriculum uh, around what he calls teams of men and sort of this responsibility. And I think Kyle Smith mentioned it on an LA court report zoom call, you know, a couple months ago about, you know, we're in the character development business and that's our job. You know, the other part is, uh, just the vehicle to do it. But, uh, you know, I was amazed when we had our first conversation as a team, we had 32 kids, you know, young boys, age 14 to 17. Uh, and I threw up a list of, terms that I think they all have heard um, and you know that includes the big buzzwords like systemic racism but also things like redlining right I had a kid who asked me well wait so coach what's redlining uh, and so helping them understand and then being willing and having the humility and I think we ask this of ourselves all the time as leaders and coaches to say well if I don't know the answer I'm going to go find it out for them but no learning our kids you know, knowing what they do know and what they don't know, and then how can we help close that gap um, to educate them on on the things that you know they think or that we think it would be helpful for them to know. I, I was surprised at the number of things that kids didn't know, uh, and it was eye opening, and it was it was powerful to be involved in helping them in that. Would now be a good time to go through the presentation that Lou and Mike and Jamal Adams have put together. Okay. Give me a moment. While Steve is doing this, when you, uh, Mike, you had mentioned you've reached out to some other coaches across your campus. What has been their kind of response? Are they engaged? Are they, you know, willing to do this? Do they think their kids would be you know, enthusiastic about this as well? Uh, so I've only had one of the, those conversations so far. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, there was a sense that, and, and I, I obviously have low hanging fruit that I chose uh, just to yeah. sort of <laughs> to, uh, to try to not, uh, yeah. you know, we're going to get discouraged in the process. Lou, you know, mentioned it earlier that it's, that's inevitable um you know if but you know if, like that's a part of one of the skills we're trying to teach our kids is uh is you know just keep going forward and so i that was a productive conversation it was hey what can we do how can we get involved um and, and to be honest I, my hope and this was the first part of the conversation was really it was more of a heads up um because i feel like there's more power in our student athletes challenging each other um, agree with that. and reaching across their uh, social groups to 
have that conversation or to say, hey, look, here's what we're doing. Uh, you know, we'd love to get you guys on board. Or, you know, I, some of it started our guys. Uh, I shared with them a video that was um, developed by uh, the women's soccer team at UNC Greensboro. Uh, and they, you know, basically accepted the all in uh, to vote or the, um, the all vote no play challenge. Uh, and they challenged other teams at their school. So I think that was kind of the model. Uh, our guys wrote a script. Uh, they are uh, actually recording the video this weekend, and then they're going to go uh, and create uh, a challenge for uh, the other teams uh, on our campus and then the other schools in our league. Uh, again, uh, you know, some really good advice I got from Coach Reveno in as we started developing this is that your instinct is to want to do more. Uh, and he just said, don't bite off more than you can chew. Uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, be, you know, get really excited about whatever it is that you can accomplish at whatever level uh, and whatever, you know, first ring uh, of achievement and then worry about. So like, like for me this week, you know, we're going to launch Tuesday uh, with our team. We're going to challenge them to each reach out to at least 10 people, have a goal uh, of 500 for the program. So I'm hoping that, you know, a couple of guys who claim they can, you know, reach 60 or 100 uh, as easy as they think, uh, they'll find out it's a bigger challenge. But um, that part, I think, is where we're going to focus. And then I'm going to share what we're doing uh, and invite as many people who, you know, who are within that circle to, you know, go ahead and be a part of it. Great. So let's go ahead and walk through the presentation. Westview votes. Next slide. And then when it's time to go on to the next slide, just cue me and I'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. So this is just for us identifying the problem. Um, and again, I think, you know, you know, having worked for, uh, you know, Coach Reveno with, you know, who brings his Stanford MBA lens to a lot of uh, our conversations uh, around basketball and coaching, uh, you know, identifying the problem first was huge for us. Uh, and again, the fact that this quote on the left came directly from the Census Bureau, uh, non-partisan. This is not a Republican issue, a Democrat issue, a Libertarian issue. This is not right a left or right issue. This is an American issue. Uh, and our, you know, the design of our democracy has voting as the central vehicle, and we don't do it. Uh, and that, to me, uh, was alarming and disheartening, and it felt like, okay, that's a, something everybody can do. Again, sort of this college age movement was, um, yes, 18 to 24 year olds, that number at the bottom is really disheartening. Uh, and hopefully all of us who reach 14 to 17 year olds uh, can be uh, a catalyst for that changing over time. Because if they're more aware of what's going on, they're more likely to become engaged when they do turn 18. Um, but again, that was eye opening for me. Yeah. Go on. Um, so, uh, Lou, maybe you want to talk a little bit about sort of your experience and communication with when we all vote. Like, I'll just say that, you know, for us, the idea was that Westview votes, uh, hashtag Westview votes was a idea that we could carry into our community and then can be easily replaced by somebody who wants to replicate this. Um, but for us, it was in for us, the, uh, the, the nonpartisan uh, school driven call to action, that was a big component that I think our guys wanted to make sure uh, were in uh, our mission statement. Because, you know, in our first conversation, I reminded them that uh, not everybody's going to agree on the issues that came out of the George Floyd murder, not just the, the murder itself, right? But um, there are political issues that get raised in these conversations that, uh, and it's, and I understand why it's uncomfortable because you can open uh, the door for, you know, for young uh, men and women to have conversations that they're emotionally invested in, that they're passionate about, and that they're not quite sure how to proceed. Um, so that's clearly something that was, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to established early in our norms and structures for conversation. Uh, but again, the idea that this is a nonpartisan effort uh, to empower our kids to 
understand this central pillar of our democracy. And so a lot of the resources came from when we all vote and I'll let Lou maybe sort of talk through his. Can I ask a question about the images here on this slide? Um, who are the, it appears to be like a country music couple. I don't happen to know who they are. So uh, I, I know that's, I think Shania Twain, but I know she, and I don't know who she's married to, so. I, I guess on the idea of nonpartisan in this type of image uh, with, it appears to be Michelle Obama front and center, um, Lynn Manuel Miranda top right, whatever. Um, perhaps a more bipartisan look here could be um, part of the story in, in terms of convincing anybody who had a question as to whether voting is partisan or not. Just my two cents worth. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I, this. The image comes directly from when we all vote, and um, it is a Michelle Obama. That's I, I didn't know the organization when we all vote. Spearheaded, right initiative. I certainly personally don't mean any disrespect to Michelle Obama, but in terms of, again, a, a school environment, a public school environment, a uh, an ability to tell people that this is a nonpartisan um, initiative, um, some of, that that might be a, a question about this. So the organization, um, how I how I ended up getting in contact when we all vote, I reached out to Kenny Blakeney, who's the head coach at Howard. We played against each other when I was at Clemson. He was at Duke. And he said that uh, when we all vote had really been instrumental in helping him get information to his team. Uh, so I looked around and tried to do research of other organizations. Uh, I felt that Michelle Obama's brand uh, was something that I wanted to align myself with. Uh, Tom Hanks being from Oakland uh, and going to Skyline High School, I felt comfortable with that. Uh, Chris Paul, who has become um, a good person uh, in terms of the O'Dow community and helping us. Um, so these are people that are that are on the, the board that support when we all vote. And I was trying to find an organization that had software that we could somehow tally, you know, how many kids or young people or men and women that a school gets to, to register. So I'll, in theory, I would wanna compete against Fairfax or Moreau up here in the Bay Area. I talked to the local media and they said that they would cover it you know, once a week to see what schools were registering the most kids to vote. And then I started to think, well, why does it need to be a competition against? Why can't it be a competition with? I'd rather have a cumulative number anyway. It doesn't really matter and I guess some of that came from when I reached out to Nike and Adidas, I said, well, hey, you have all this gear that you're probably not gonna use because there's no AAU this summer. What if you rewarded the school that had the most kids to register with that gear instead of just eating it or holding on to it? And when that wasn't received well, that's kind of when I said, okay, well then let's just do a cumulative number because that's really what matters in the end anyway. It doesn't need to be a competition. So uh, when we all vote, uh, which is, you know, nonpartisan, uh, which is what I felt was an important message to get across to a diverse uh, group of people from the left all the way to the right is like we talked about earlier. I, I don't care who you vote for. I do care that you register to vote and that you vote. Uh, and whatever happens, it happens. I do believe in the process if people do go out and vote. Um, so that was kind of the, the alignment with when we all vote. Uh, they had good information. Um, I thought it was their alignment with different states. Like I said, the process literally is a five minute process to register to vote. Um, and, you know, anyone could shape the slides how they wanted to. If someone wanted to make it, uh, you know, all white people, all women, all blacks, all Latina, I mean, anyone could, you know, put that into their slides if they wanted to. Um, so that was kind of the thought behind it. Uh, there were other organizations. Um, you know, I'm a big Barack Obama, Michelle Obama fan, so I definitely wanted to align myself uh, with them. And, you know, John, the collegiate sort of all in to vote movement, which is where uh, the college coaches have partnered. Um, it's a it's a very college focused branding. Right. So they're you know, kids who wear cool clothes, which I wouldn't know what they were if uh, I saw them other than the fact that my daughter who's 20 would tell me what they are. Um, 
and, and I, I don't know, I just felt like for the conversation, because again, I think this is, this to me is what we show our kids. Um, I don't know the politics of the people on screen other than uh, Michelle Obama. Uh, I'm sure I could guess uh, with, you know, Hollywood and the NBA, but um, I, I understand that concern. And again, how we communicate that, you know, I, I think Lou's point was part of what the sharing is, is look, you're going to go in and replace the word Westview and you're, you're going to replace the logos and, if you want to put in uh, a whole different set of people, uh, awesome. I, I know, I think that's great conversation. And I think we should probably move on to the next slide right now, which would be the game plan. Can you talk us through the game plan? So again, just the idea is that I wanted our kids to think about three things real concretely. Conversation, which we've already talked about, uh, and being engaged in that conversation. Uh, you know, later on, there'll be some, you know, we share some scripting to help those who may not be comfortable, but engaging in conversation about voter registration um, from a social psych psychology standpoint is really uh, getting them to commit, right? It's uh, almost, you know, like you kind of got to ask for the sale. Uh, so, you know, can I get your commitment that you'll register to vote? Uh, can I get your commitment that you uh, that you will go make sure you're registered to vote? Because when you ask, a lot of people will say, I'm registered to vote. And I'm always surprised to hear stories about people who thought they were registered to vote. Uh, like when we found out with my daughter who's 20. Uh, she, so she's currently in college in Pennsylvania, but never registered to vote there. So she remained registered here in Oregon. Well, she's home now for this upcoming semester uh, because of the, of the coronavirus. Uh, they still had her address uh, for an absentee ballot in Pennsylvania. So it was really good for us to go through and say, well, okay, we may need to change that. Uh, so that was really good. So the commitment piece. And then the last thing is just the confirmation piece. I mean, again, accountability wise is asking for people to confirm back to you. And again, mm -hmm. I feel like the community that they know will be a lot more responsive to confirm and commit to our players, right, than they would to me if I was trying to, to reach out to the community. Great. Again, just thinking through what's that conversation, who are we trying to reach, and again, in the states that allow you to register at 16, uh, you know, I'm okay if those kids aren't going to register because this is a long-term, right, this is a long-horizon event, not just how many people you know can we get to vote in november you know we want to change the culture and conversation around voting um, again so you know as lou mentioned those resources i think are really big uh and who those partners were there's lots of different places but uh when we all vote simplified it so you know so so arming our kids with the resources to say when somebody commits to register send them the link give them the qr code um, or if they have, you know, if they told you, you are, that they already are registered and, you know, giving them the tools to go confirm their registration and then get that commitment back. And again, just confirmation is following up, you know, if, if the kids think, you know, I, how that accountability piece works, uh, I think will play out. Um, hopefully they're accountable as individuals to our collective effort. Uh, maybe they think there's playing time involved, so they're going to be accountable to me. Uh, they're wrong, but that's okay if they, if I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to dissolve that illusion for them if, if that motivates them. Uh, but ultimately, you know, they want to create an accountability workflow where those people are, you know, confirming, yes, I voted, yes, I registered. Uh, and then, you know, in, in our case, Hopefully, we, you know, we'll start to get confirmations of, you know, community members having voted in, uh, you know, late mm -hmm. October. Okay. Like Lou said, it's, you know, we don't want to compete against anyone else, right? We want to compete against our goal. Uh, so we want each of the kids to get at least 10. I think we've got 41 returning players. So hopefully we can get to 500 as a team, I mean, as a program just giving them vehicles. And again, this is the conversation I want to lead with them. Uh, they'll brainstorm to tell me if they want to make a TikTok and I need to be in it. Uh, I'm willing to embarrass myself for the cause, uh, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that's a last resort. 
And then again, this was the video challenge uh, that our guys uh, have put together. Really proud of the work they did to to build the script. Uh, they're they're you know collecting uh, their their recordings over the weekend, and the goal was to have a uh, version that we can share on Tuesday. So we'll see how that goes. And again, these are just some of those resources that um, whether you know, they want to tweet them out or, uh, you know, Instagram post those. Um, and then this piece uh, was just a Google sheet that uh, that we're going to use to to track for accountability. Um, just, again, asking each of them to log those conversations, commitments, and confirmations. I'm not sure we need to read the scripts off, but again, mm -hmm. if anyone, you know, wants this, those are the things that are in there to give your kids. And then this last one, so sorry, Steve, if you can go back one slide. So I added that this morning again. So this was something that came back from uh, Rev yesterday. Taj Finger, who uh, played at Stanford and was on staff at Georgia Tech, his sister started do something.org. Uh, sorry, can his. You tell, can sorry. you tell us a little bit? Yeah, so I just, this was my first exposure to it, but it's ba it's basically a treasure trove of additional resources to go do other things. Um, so for coaches who are, you know, maybe leery of the voting politics, uh, or maybe that's not what their group uh, was excited about, uh, do something.org has an unbelievable list of uh, really community-based and even virtual uh, community projects uh, to go and again like it says do something uh, and so again I think it's a pretty valuable resource for for people to explore fantastic and, and then again our goal is to get to 500 by September 22nd which is National Voter Registration Day um, if each kid can get those 10 initial conversations by then I think that's a realistic goal uh, and then looking to go for the follow-ups and the confirmations in the weeks that lead up to the to the election. Great, great place for the presentation to end. Brad, how many days did you say there were until the uh, election? Oh, Brad was. To, I think how many days out are we now? Like sixty-five or something like that. I think it's. I think it's an even sixty-five yeah. uh, as of today. Yeah. Mike and Lou, that's really an awesome presentation. That is uh, just so uh, well put together. Great job. Very good. And for those of you who have followed along, uh, Mike and Lou were pretty clear that I hope I can speak for you when I say nothing would make you happier than someone taking it and plagiarizing it essentially and tweaking it to, to their school community. We want the civic engagement we want people to know the steps to become civically engaged. Is that yeah, a fair I'm thing really good if they make it better and send it back to me too. That's fine. <laughs> we'll give you credit, Wolf. It's just like you're out of bounds plays. <laughs> so in the last few minutes, is there a good way to, that we can kind of wrap up? Uh, are there any things that you've been kind of holding on that you'd like to contribute that you weren't able to say at some point, now would be a great time to bring them up. I don't, I don't like to make people feel uncomfortable and call on them, uh, but I would you, love, yeah, go ahead. You had a good point about voting is more than just the presidential election. I think that's something that you really got to emphasize. You're, you're fed up with the police. Well, maybe we can do something to impact uh, that situation through voting. It's not just the president. I mean, hell, there's a lot of people who vote just to vote against Trump because they don't like him, but there is a lot more than that. That, Waxy, you're, that's a hell of a point you made. Yeah, I also, appreciate it. Yeah. You know, in terms of the police, I, I don't know how many, I happen to be a social studies teacher also, but you know, the sheriff is voted for on everybody's ballot. I don't know that this November in every single county that the county sheriff is up for re-election, but, um, you know. One I in Arkansas that's up for re-election. People re don't know that. <laughs> Pardon? And there's one in Arkansas that needs to be replaced now. Yeah. 
No doubt. Uh, the, the, so the only thing I want to add, uh, Wax, is, and again, I, I show my cards and where my discussions and mentoring maybe have come from, but Reb gave me a really good suggestion as he got through this college level voter initiative, as he said, um, don't let perfect right, be the enemy of progress. Uh, and I think we can all want it to be perfect before we let it out of the, of the box, but ultimately we just go do something. And, and that's, I think that's going to be the message I have for my kids because they're going to be uncomfortable having some of these conversations and they're going to want them to be perfect and they won't. And that's okay. And I think they have to accept that and just be engaged, right? Conversation is number one. And conversation can also, you know, we talked about being uncomfortable. Conversation is a great way for players who do differ in their political beliefs to have a conversation because we're living in a time when people aren't really interested as much in what the other side thinks, we cast them as wrong. And I think, you know, again, uh, David tells me this all the time, people don't go to social media to change their minds. <laughs> and, 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 and I think conversation would be a great bridge into creating those safe spaces we talked about where people who differ can actually share their thoughts, share why they believe things, and then attitude change can start to happen, which is, which is a healthy thing. Uh, we're living in this uh, cancel culture, smackdown politics that's not necessarily uh, the best thing because it just, it's so polarizing. And I think really in the world of politics, uh, a little compromise is, is gonna go a long way. No, I, I think when you talk about valuable discourse, you make, a, you make a very good point. Many times more people wanna talk than they wanna listen. Um, mm -hmm. I know, you know, in our community, what we really wanted to do was, where are you going to be at in 10 years when you look back? How are you going to feel morally about decisions you made from a social justice and from a COVID piece? Um, you know, can you really, can you really put the community before yourself? Um, and then I think the one thing that I would challenge everybody on here is if we were to meet again in two weeks or a month, is for everybody on here to go get 10 schools, 10 people, 10 coaches, you know, what is the impact, you know, that has come from this meeting right here? Uh, to me, that would be the most valuable thing for all of us to get together again and say, hey, look, this is what we've done. We've reached out to this, this, that, and the other so that we could see the deliverables uh, from the action items. I appreciate that. Uh, again, it is a small group. So David, is there anything that you'd like to say before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, um, uh, just hearing from, from everyone, and it makes me think about how um, I try to teach my students on how to communicate well and communicate effectively. And depending on where, where your students and where your uh, players are, um, maybe they, they get more comfortable sharing their stories, not just to their team members, but to beyond the team and to other students. Um, so it's, 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 the issue is at home. It, it's, it's not an issue just in a city far away in another state, but you may, these may be issues that exist um, in the community, in their own community. Um, I know that young people don't vote a lot, that their voting rates are really low, and partially because they don't feel confident in, in knowing the issues. And so being able to talk and having discourse about the issues um, can raise their confidence so that voting becomes a habit when they do turn 18. Um, in Southern California, there's several newspapers that are printing articles about um, these issues and, and very informative articles, uh, and perhaps sharing those with your players and with students so that they feel more informed so that when they do get to that voting age, they're more confident in, in standing on the issue and making a choice. Thank you. Lou, anything before we wrap up? No, I'm sorry. I was talking to my fiance. I apologize. Oh, I, actually, I was going to con you no matter what. So, okay. Coach Freitas, anything before we wrap up? No. Okay. Coach Blars? Sure, I just want to credit you, uh, Steve, with um, the great work you've done these past months with uh, the court report, our meeting here today, and um, you know what you've done on social media, and I'm sure that you'll be continuing to do all those things with this uh, voting initiative, and it's much appreciated. Thank you, thank you very much, and Coach Wolf. Yeah, just thanks for uh, your enthusiasm and 
and your energy. Ultimately, I think uh, it takes it takes a relentless effort. I think you know any successful operation to help kids uh, is not going to be much different than what we ask them to do is when we're coaching them. Um, and uh, it, it, it takes leadership. It takes you know commitment. It takes uh, the energy to to be unstoppable and be relentless and we're not solving this thing uh, this week and we're going to come back like Lou said in two weeks and have some some really good things to to, to celebrate but uh, we're not going to fix this this is uh, this is the battle for uh, a long time I think on one of the zoom calls that you had last month um, with um, with coach Barnes right the the fruits of this labor will uh, not re reveal themselves until long after our lifetime, but we've got to still do the work. No doubt.